On WNIN Lawmakers this week, our guest is Evansville Mayor Lloyd Winicky. We'll also get an update from the Indiana General Assembly. It's all coming up on WNIN Lawmakers. Welcome to the program. I'm John Gibson, Morning Edition host for WNIN-FM. Before we speak with Mayor Winicky, here's a quick update from Indianapolis. Indiana Public Broadcasting's Brandon Smith reports on the week at the State House. House Republicans tout in their budget $378 million in new spending for K-12 education, about a third of which will go to private school vouchers, and grants for small business recovery, student learning loss, law enforcement, and regional economic development. Democrats say the budget doesn't do enough for working Hoosiers, lamenting the GOP's rejection of all of the Democrats' proposals, including more money for food banks, women and minority-owned businesses, and pre-K. Legislation that cleared the Senate would restrict the governor from declaring a widespread public emergency for longer than 60 days. The measure is a response to lawmakers' unhappiness with many of the governor's COVID-19 executive orders. And the House advanced a bill to eliminate the state's license requirement to carry a handgun in public. It also orders the state to create a system for frontline police officers to quickly identify anyone who's not allowed to carry in a bid to placate law enforcement agencies opposed to the bill. But such a system might not be legally possible. For Indiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Brandon Smith at the State House. Our guest today is Evansville Mayor Lloyd Winicky. Mayor, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, John. Good to see you. Good to see you. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, what we've been talking about for more than a year now, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it's been almost a year now since uh, the first cases uh, were found here in our area. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the local community response to the pandemic over the past year? Uh, how do you believe it's gone? Where do we go from here? Yeah, uh, boy, that's uh, we could talk the entire program <laughs> yes, about that one question, John. You know, I, I think the re community res response has been, uh, frankly, extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, I, I think as a community, we've shown our resilience. Uh, I think that we have recognized where there are gaps in uh, services to help people. Mm -hmm. So I think you've you've seen you know, countless acts of good deeds that have gone uh, that have occurred over these last 12 months, all in the name of trying to support our, our friends and neighbors. Um, I think we've seen collaboration at, a, at an even higher level than already exists. Mm -hmm. I, I talk to mayors all over in Indiana and, and they follow what we're doing on social media and, and other forms of media. And, and they all often ask, how do we get things done down here? And I talk about the collaboration, but I think the collaboration has taken, has been taken to a new level because of the mm -hmm. pandemic in our community. And that's, that's helped us as a community uh, get through it. Yeah, now you mentioned uh, some of the gaps. Uh, what, what are some of the assistance programs that are out there that the city is uh, sponsoring that uh, are available to Evansville residents who might still be uh, facing hardships uh, due to the pandemic? Yeah, I, I would tell you probably the largest one is, is, our, is the Feed Evansville initiative. And, that, and that's not a city government operation per se, but we certainly did use uh, uh, CARES Act money to buy a refrigerated truck for that for that mm -hmm. operation to work. Um, what happened, uh, again, going back uh, a year when schools uh, in the spring closed right. and many kids, I mean, you know, thousands of kids who rely on schools for their breakfast and lunch had no means of nutrition. And so and while there are a lot of people working in the food space, I would call it, the coordination was sometimes intermittent. Right. So when the Feed Evansville group started, Lisa Vaughn and council member Alex Burton and others uh, pulled together to recognize this gap, literally people were driving around with food and coolers in their in their cars. So the city stepped in, bought the refrigerated uh, truck and you know, thousands and thousands of boxes of food have been given to uh, area residents who are in need. Uh, a need still exists, although mm -hmm. schools, thankfully, have been in session. Um, but as a result of all that, we just recently created uh, the first ever food commission for the city. So that will bring together 
all the people, all the organizations that are working in the food area. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we want to, at the end, a, a more coordinated effort. Uh, we certainly recognize there are parts of our city that live in food deserts, that is, a limited access to nutritional, uh, nutritious food. Right. So we think that's one of the things, one of the long-term um, sort of blessings, if you will, that have come from this, the recognition that there needs to be a greater, more coordinated effort in food. Yeah. And of course, the pandemic has taken such an economic toll in addition to the, uh, the, the health toll and, and of course, uh, the numerous deaths. Um, can you speak a little bit about how COVID has affected uh, the finances of the uh, city of Evansville? Well, we, we certainly have experienced uh, a significant loss of revenue. Uh, and that is evidenced by our 2021 budget. We eliminated uh, 16 positions from the city budget uh, year over year, and those mm -hmm. were difficult decisions. Um, early in the pandemic, um, when the uh, casino closed, right. we knew that we were gonna have a shortfall in casino revenue. Uh, Pre-pandemic, we'd, re we'd realize about a million dollars a month in casino revenue. Uh, that gaming revenue allows us to buy, uh, you know, snow plows and police cars and fire trucks and mm -hmm. all those kinds of things. So we immediately went to the, the council and repealed um, in two different sessions, a little over, I think approximately $3.45 million. Uh, we kept positions that were open, uh, that, were, that were vacant. We left right. them open for uh, probably longer than usual. And then the budget process was candidly the hardest one we've done since we've been in office mm -hmm. uh, starting in 2012. Uh, next year's, uh, the budget for next year will be even more challenging. Right. We, one of the revenue streams is local income tax. So the easiest way to think of this as unemployment goes up, right. fewer people working, sure. that revenue go, goes down. Right. So in a typical year, again, all in, we receive about $24 million a year in LIT funding. Uh, that revenue goes to the state, the state holds it and then r distributes it to local municipalities uh, in the rears, if you will. Mm -hmm. So um, the money that we got last year was, was, ex was uh, taken by the state the year before, et cetera. So mm -hmm. the state made us whole, made community, all communities whole by giving us 14 months of revenue for this year, but next year it's only going to be 10 months of revenue. Right. And so we know that that will be a significant loss of revenue for the coming, for the 2022 budget. Uh, but is, is there any way the state could help, uh, again, give you, uh, you know, perhaps another 14 months, if you will? Yeah, were. I don't know if it's 14 months, but we certainly uh, have raised the issue to the state level, and uh, they are aware that you know, they, they worked with us to get through this year. And I, you know, the approach that I think they're taking and it's the approach we take, let's, let's face the budget crisis that we're facing immediately and, and figure it out as we get closer. Um, so we certainly have raised the issue and mm -hmm. we'll see what happens. And I guess the good news is we're not alone. Every city, uh, every town, every county is facing the same situation. Everyone's numbers are, are a little different, but right. uh, more or less everyone's in the same kind of position. Yeah. Well, do you have any, uh, you know, hindsight is 2020 uh, type things uh, regarding, uh, you know, thoughts about uh, both really the local and the state response to COVID? Anything that uh, perhaps uh, should have been done differently or? I, I don't, I don't I, it's, it's tough to sit back and say, okay, here's what I would have done differently because the challenge with COVID, John, was that initially, you know, things were ch changing, evolving, if, you know, some, in many cases daily. Right. So we would make plans, whether it's for the operation of city government or a, a broader community response. And then the next day, the CDC would say, okay, now we know this. Right. And that's not to be an indictment of the CDC, but it, it was in fact, a, a novel virus. That is a uh, new uh, virus. Is no a, one knew. a learning process. Yeah, it was. And so, I know many times in our communications to uh, department heads, to the broader community and media availability was, here's our plan now, but flexibility is going to be key. So it's, it's tough to look back and say, golly, I wish I had done this differently because right. in fact, we were operating and making decisions based on information we had at the time and it was 
quickly changing. Sure, sure. I would tell you that one of the things I've communicated to state government is I, I think when everyone steps back and looks at this from a really global, well, a state global perspective, right. if you will, is how county health departments operate. We are f really fortunate. We have a great county health department. The Vanderbilt County Ho Health Department, Dr. Ken Spear, Joe Grease, Lynn Herr, their team, they have been phenomenal. But it's a lo relatively large department compared mm -hmm. to health departments, other de health departments in our area that are significantly smaller, don't have the same resources. And yet the decisions they make in adjoining counties mm -hmm. affected sure, us. Sure. We're the primary hub for healthcare, for commerce. So I think going forward, we need to figure out a better way to administer public health and put more resources into, into making sure that, uh, that there's, there's equity in public health and just uh, greater, greater communication and accessibility, if you will. You mentioned uh, the state's uh, response and some, some extra revenue from them. Uh, overall, what do you, how, how do you feel, uh, what grade would you give, I guess, to the state in its response to uh, the COVID-19 and how it has uh, helped or maybe not helped uh, the community enough? I, I think I don't think I'd be so bold as to give our local response or the state response a letter grade. I, I would say this. Uh, I, I compare our situation with that of other communities and other states around the country just by mm -hmm. watching mm -hmm. the national media. Right. And you think, wow, while we have had problems and you know we've had you know almost 400 deaths just in Vanderbilt County, um, you know the toll on a the human toll is certainly devastating, right. but it's not nearly as bad as it is in other communities. So I, I think a lot of really good decisions have been made um, in this kind of in this line of work. You know, you, you know, going in as a public official that you're not going to make everyone happy with any decision you make on any issue. And pre-pandemic, I would you know I would say yeah, you make some people happy and some people unhappy. Mm -hmm. During the pandemic, you know, it, it was because things became so polarized, you know, I, I started to say, you know, you either pe make people elated or irritate, really irritated. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how the reactions were. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we just made the best decisions we can, we could with the information we had at the time, trying not to be, make knee-jerk reactions, mm -hmm. trying to be thoughtful, uh, trying to use data, and just we tried to make be level-headed about things. Now we talked uh, before we went on the air about uh, uh, the vaccine, and uh, we're seeing some improving numbers. We're seeing uh, more folks getting the shots in arms. Uh, you have gotten your first shot. I have as well. Um, you know, what, what is your message to folks out there uh, as far as getting the vaccine? Yeah, I, I will tell you on a really personal level. I was eager to get it. Uh, my wife uh, has had her vaccinations, and I'm really grateful for that. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to encourage as many people as possible to get the vaccine. It's one of the ways we know we can continue the trend that we're on, you know, for, uh, for m weeks, if not months. We talked about flattening the curve, you know, before we even really knew what flattening the curve right, meant. Right, yes. uh, but, you know, today we're on a really good trend, and we want that trend to continue. We know that uh, spring break, uh, vacations are planned. They were right around the corner. We don't want a resurgence of cases based on that. So, you know, the thing that people can do is get vaccinated, wear uh, masks, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and socially distance when appropriate. You know, all the things we've been talking about for a year until we reach that level of, of herd immunity and the, the medical community is, is satisfied with where we are. Right. Is there a fear that folks are going to you know, let their guard down a bit as those numbers go down? Uh, well, I think it's, it's human instinct, I yeah, think. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I've been preaching about wearing a mask for, for a year now, and it's, you know, I'll, I'll have it right next to my car keys in the office, and I'll be in a hurry to rush out the door, and I'll grab my keys, and I'll get to the door, oh, my mask. Right. It's right. just human nature. Mm -hmm. And so I, I do think as we see news coverage and just just the data that comes in where, you know, maybe we have 28 or 35 cases a day, whatever the numbers are, mm -hmm. significantly lower than how they've been in the past. It's easy to go, hey, OK, we're good. Mm -hmm. Well, we're we're better 
but right. we have to we, we have to remain vigilant. All right. Well, let's uh, get on to uh, some of the other uh, city issues. Uh, we just had a uh, pretty severe cold snap uh, here in the uh, Evansville area. And uh, the water and sewer department is working to keep some pretty old lines maintained. And of course, there's those, those big federal uh, mandates. Uh, how are things coming in the, in the world of uh, infrastructure? Busy, very, very busy. Mm -hmm. um, for, I, I have to tell you the story. Just this morning, I received in the morning mail a, a letter from a customer of the Evansville Water and Sewer Utility who was driving home uh, 10 o'clock the other night, 10, 11 o'clock and they knew that they didn't have water at their house and they passed a crew working in a, in a big hole repairing a big water main right, break. Right. So, uh, and he, he called to thank me for that crew's hard work and we certainly extended that thanks to those, those members of the mm -hmm. water and sewer team that were out there working. But you know what happens is, as, as everyone knows, I and mean, it's pretty basic stuff, when, when it gets really cold, everything contracts when it gets hot it expands and you have fluctuating temperatures of, of the water running through those pipes and a lot of the a lot of the pipes are old uh, mm -hmm. we have a, you know roughly a thousand miles of water line 90 percent or so cast iron mm -hmm. uh, much of it at or near end of life so our crews are working there is no shortage of water main breaks we're also, uh, we're starting a big water line replacement up First Avenue, uh, replacing a 36 inch main from roughly Morgan Avenue to Ivy Tech. Uh, that's to improve the quality of service to the North End and to our customers in the Northern part of the county and into Gibson County. Right. So uh, there's no shortage of work in the water and sewer department. Lots of work to be done obviously, but uh, you, I, I assume you have to balance that somewhat with uh, water bills, water and sewer bills of course have been uh, on the rise uh, in recent years. Uh, what can uh, rate payers expect in, in that uh, realm? So in 2017, we made a commitment to try and replace 15 miles of water line a year. Mm -hmm. As I just said, we have roughly a thousand miles of line. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've never really, until 2017, we'd never replace water line. If something broke, we fixed it. Right. But I mean, eventually that's gonna catch up with you and it, it, it has started to catch up. You, we have hundreds of water main breaks a year. So uh, we'll have a, a new water rate uh, case to take to the Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission uh, sometime this spring, uh, looking out probably for projects over the next three to five years. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, we continue our negotiations with the EPA to try and uh, reconfigure our, our consent decree so we can extend some of these big projects that we know mm -hmm. we have to do on the sewer side. But I mean, the, these are all big, high ticket, high cost projects. What we'd like to do and what we've asked the EPA and our partner at IDEM to do is to see if we can extend those out so we can delay huge increases in bills. Mm -hmm. uh, we're certainly cognizant of it, uh, but at the end of the day, if we don't fix what we have and if we don't replace what we have, um, you know, here's a tidbit that I, you, you may, I bet you don't know this. Our water treatment plant on Water Works Road, beautiful mm -hmm. old building, mm -hmm. the operative word old. It opened in 1900. Right. 1900. Uh, a lot of the tech, the, some of the newest technology is 50 to 60 years old. Right. So that, that's a risk for our community, frankly. Mm -hmm. And so we continue to monitor uh, uh, what's going on with both the water and sewer utility. We know we have uh, sinkholes that develop mm -hmm. uh, in, in throughout the city. We do our best to address those as quickly as possible with the resources that we sure, have. Sure, sure. Are there any uh, specific concerns at the, uh, the old uh, waterworks plant? Nothing like imminent, no, but right. we know that uh, we have to start planning for the future. Yeah. We, we can't rely on a 121 year old facility uh, for another 50, 50, 60 years. At some point, we're going, we're, we have to address it, and I suspect we'll have to address it right. sooner rather than later. And what we don't want to do, John, we, we don't want to be where we were with sewers, where, right. where you know, there's a crisis. Right. We'd rather look ahead and say, golly, okay, this opened in 1900. We've gotten our money's worth. What do we do, need to, how do we need to invest mm -hmm. in the utility to make it viable for another hundred years because at the end of the day you know if we don't have a viable workable water and sewer utility 
how do we live our lives in our homes and our businesses? How do we attract new businesses and new jobs to the community? It's really critical that we continue to make investment in our utility. Speaking of water, another uh, project uh, is the new aquatic center over in uh, Garvin Park. Uh, looks like it's coming right along. What is the uh, timeline looking at? Yeah, the... it's it, it's going really well. Outside of the two or three weeks, uh, really cold snap, we've mm. had great construction weather. We anticipate that it will be done in the July, August time frame. I think uh, everyone's a little coy about telling me, giving me an exact opening date. Mm -hmm. uh, if I had it, I'd certainly share it. But I think that want to kind of assess where they are with the end of the winter construction season. But this is a really exciting project. The Deaconess Aquatic Center will have two indoor pools. One is a competitive pool for swimming and diving with seating for 900 people. So we'll be able to attract uh, meet swim meets and dive meets that our community has never ever been able to host. Mm -hmm. In the same building will be a recreational pool for th therapy, for swim lessons, for recreation. Outdoor will be a splash park right across the street from Bossy Field. So mm -hmm. if you want to go to an Otters game, mm -hmm. have the kids run through the splash park before the game or after, you know, it's, it's, it's really a dynamic project and we think we'll, it will really change the swim community. It will help develop a new uh, you know, we want more Lily Kings. Right, right. Another project uh, that's uh, getting a lot of uh, ink, you might say. Uh, a developer plans to uh, demolish uh, Evansville's tallest building, the old, old National Bank building on Main Street. Replace it with a, uh, a business and residential development. It would be a lot shorter. <laughs> it would no longer be our, our tallest building. What, what are your thoughts on that project? Are you confident that's, uh, that's going to work? Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, th this is really a, uh, w we've been working on this effort for many years to mm -hmm. try and find a way to refurbish this, this building. Um, the, the developer is from out of town, the Fort Wayne area. Uh, they, have out, they also have local private investors. Uh, we're working on the capital stack now, trying to make sure the financing all works. If we can get the financial uh, package uh, assembled in the way we want, you know, in the next, you know, month or so, mm -hmm. a month and a half maybe. I, th I think you could see the implosion of that tower in the next, you know, four to six months, mm. roughly. Yeah. Uh, the demolition of the Sycamore building on the same block. In its place, you would see uh, a six-story building and a four-story building, mixed-use development, residential, um, uh, office space, I mean, really a dynamic project. What the developer found once they bought the, the, the parcel of land and really got in and looked at the building, the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing, sort of the guts of the building, was not really able to be repurposed in the manner or to the extent they thought they could. Mm -hmm. And it really became cost prohibitive to try and refurbish that tower. You know, as much as it, we like having an 18-story building, it just, it's just not going to work. And, mm -hmm. um, and we're not really in a position to be building 18-story buildings in uh, in Evansville right now. But we are able to build a, a new, really uh, a, a dynamic project that I think will be a catalyst for even more investment in the downtown. And I, yeah, I'm excited about the project and I, I think it's going to work. All right. Uh, recently, uh, the city uh, issued a uh, climate action plan uh, calling for the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 50% uh, by 2050. I believe that's the goal. Uh, what's it going to take uh, as you see it? So this was an effort uh, that's been a couple years in the making. We've, we've been thinking about how to approach this. The city, while we were, individual departments were doing things in the space of uh, um, climate action or mm -hmm. energy conservation or whatever, there was not a, cons uh, a really a, a very specific plan on what, what we should be doing. So uh, we used a, we partnered with Indiana University. Timothy Weir was uh, a retired business executive who helped shepherd this project. Uh, I think there are 58 or 60 sort of potential action items. And they're not all, in fact, most of them are not about, all about city government, but about mm -hmm. what can be done collaboratively to uh, create a, a more environmentally friendly community. So uh, we encourage people to go out and, and look at that on the city website. We had 18, roughly 1,800 people participate in the, uh, in, in the ascertainment or just reacting to surveys and mm -hmm. uh, throwing out ideas. So we're excited about a lot of the projects. Some of it is sort of low-hanging fruit. 
and uh, other stuff is certainly more ambitious, but it, it is a community plan and it re, re, uh, really requires a lot of collaboration among uh, stakeholders and yeah, it's, I, I'm excited about it. It really hats off to the community for participating. We only have a minute or so left here. Uh, I know you've got your State of the City address coming up in just a couple of months. Maybe you can share a little of that or at least tell us about some of your goals for the next few years in the closing seconds we have here. Sure, so the State of the City speech coming up in April, we're starting, uh, we've got a rough outline together on it. Really like the way, it, what, the way we're thinking now, it's gonna be a little different, most likely still to be virtual based mm -hmm. on the timing of it. Uh, over the next few years, we'll continue to uh, figure out how to make uh, our city safer, how to continue to invest in jobs and talent and, uh, and create a quality of place that people uh, really embrace. And we'll continue to promote a, a, the fact that uh, E is for everyone. Mm -hmm. we, we think that is a, a mantra that we, we must uh, continue to live up to. And I'm, I'm excited about the challenges. And speaking of the future, are you planning another run for mayor? Oh, we get that question a lot lately, John. I, you know, we're, we're just uh, in the second year of this term. Right. We'll, it'll probably be another year or so before we make a firm decision. But yeah, yeah. We're, we're certainly keeping all of our options open. Certainly still have a lot of energy for the position and still have a lot of love for the job. All right. Mayor Wenicke, thank you so much for joining us this week. My pleasure. Week. Thank we, you. Hope you'll, we hope you'll come back and visit soon. Anytime. All right. That is uh, Mayor Lloyd Wenicke. Uh, next week, our scheduled guest is Kentucky State Representative D.J. Johnson from Owensboro. I'm John Gibson of WNIN-FM. Thanks for joining us for WNIN Lawmakers.